So I never put those two and two together. So thank you for that. Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is you want your emotions to come out of applying truth rather than making decisions based on the emotions. Because that's... Well, emotions should come from the application of truth rather than just using your emotions. So in other words, you say, well, I'm angry. Well, then I'm going to do something about it. You don't want to do that. Instead, you should... Look at things from God's Word, have faith in that, and apply God's Word. Then you apply God's Word to the situation, and now you can have the emotion of, well, I'm angry that this happened, or, or I'm glad that this happened, or whatever. So in other words, don't let your emotions guide you. Let the truth of God's Word guide you. Then you're living by the faith of the Son of God, and then, uh, then your emotion will come out of that then, and that's fine. The, the danger we get into is a lot of times instead of, thinking of what God's Word says and applying the doctrine, we just make snap decisions based on our emotions. And then we're not following God's Word. So, Which is the flesh. Just yes. The yeah, so emotions, a lot of times we think of it as a bad thing, but there's nothing wrong with emotions. God gave them to us. It's just we don't want to be controlled by them. You know, a lot of times, that's what happens. You know, people get fearful. So then they, you know, they say, oh, well, you know, this is going to happen. I've got to... You know, like like with COVID, there were a lot of, I think a lot of decisions that people made based out of fear when COVID first came out that they probably say, well, you know, if I had thought about it, I probably wouldn't have made those decisions, you know, and I won't go into all that, but uh, that's just one example. And a lot of times people do that, you know, they say, oh, well, this sounds great. I'm going to get involved with this. And you find, uh, you know, take a job. You say, oh, that sounds like a great job. Then you Quit your job, you move across country, and find, well, that wasn't what I thought it would be. You know, you didn't think it through. You used your emotions. So it's just uh, let God's word guide you rather than your emotions. Yeah. So. Okay. And is it true that the word emotion is not in the King James Version of the Bible? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't think it's there. I mean, I got a concordance. But, uh, yeah, I don't think the word emotion is in the Bible. Uh, let's see. No, it's not. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay. Um, and then, Eric, I, I was taught, too, that you know, the days of our, our days are numbered. So when Shelly was talking about all that, I looked, I asked my phone, where is it in the Bible that the days, it says your days are numbered? And it took me to Job 14, 5 through 7. Oh, okay. I turned to Job 14, 5. Now, the King James doesn't say a man's days are numbered. This must be a different version. But um, Job 14, 5 says, Seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed point his bounds that he cannot pass. Is that, is that just meaning in God's foreknowledge, he knows how long we're going to live, like you talked about earlier? Because I totally agree with what you're saying, that we, we can, by how we eat, what we do, well, I mean, crazy things, we die. If, if we do stupid stuff, we're going to die. Mm -hmm. So... When that says seeing his days are determined, do you think that just means, and I, I don't know anything about this passage, so please correct me, but that's what my phone took me to. So I wanted your thoughts on what does that mean? Seeing yeah, and I did go to Job 14, and I read verse 14. That says, all the days of my appointed time will I wait. So, I mean, it does sound like if days of appointed time, well, then my days are numbered, you know. Um, so, okay. yeah, and Job 14, 5, his days are determined. I think the context there is really, it's not really saying that you've got a specific number of days. I, you know, like I mentioned the example, you're going to live 70 years, 3 months, and 14 days. I don't think it's that. Because if you go back to verse 1, the context there, Job 14, 1, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Mm. So I think it's... Um, uh, that, that's one of my favorite verses, by the way, because then I think of, you know, when I'm going through, you go through a trial that happens, you say, well, you said we're, we're you know, born of a woman. Well, I was born of a woman, and uh, I got full of trouble. Well, that's me, you know. So you can say, well, you know, God said it would happen, you know. <laughs> but I, I think, you know, the context is Job is going through all these problems. And, uh, and so basically he's saying, well, your days, you, you know, you got few days and you're full of trouble. And so it's more of a less in terms of the context is that you're on this earth for a short time. You know, if you've got few days, compared to eternity, it's a short time. 
So I think when verse 5 says, uh, seeing his days are determined, the number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. I think it's basically talking about your life here on earth as compared to your life in, in the spirit realm. So, you know, another verse says, uh, all flesh is as grass. You know, it's there for a moment and then it's gone. So like if I look at that grass out there, well, it's going to, it's flourishing right now. I got to cut that stupid grass with the heat index being 105 about every week. But there's going to come a day, probably sometime in November, where I won't have to be doing that so much. And it's going to die. It's, uh, it's gonna, the days, though, that grass is determined. It's going to die, but exactly what day, I don't know. You know, will it be November 1st? Will it be December 1st? Will it be November 15th? Uh, I don't know. There, there's a time period it's determined that that grass is going to die somewhere around there because that's the, the, the season of it. But the exact day, I don't know. Um, I think that's really the context of Job 14. You know, 14, 1. Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. Verse 2 even tells you about the grass. It's a flower. He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. Uh, verse 5, his days are determined. The number of his months are with thee. Verse 14, uh, the days of my appointed time. So, how long is it? I, I don't think it's saying that you are going to live 70 years, 3 months, and 14 days. I think it's saying that you've got an appointed time that you're going to be on earth. It's a short time, few days compared to eternity. So just like I can't say the grass will die on November 15th. I can say the days of the grass are, de are bound. They're determined. They're limited. They're not going to last till February. I know that. Because it's just a lifespan of the grass. Maybe it dies a little earlier this year. Maybe it's later. I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a determined thing and there, that there is a season, the grass season. And then once that season is over then it will die. And that's sort of what you could think of for us. We've got a season that's determined that we will live on this earth. Exactly how long the season is, that's up to you and your genetics and you know other things you do. Uh, but there isn't a specific day that you would die. Just like there's not a specific day that I would know the grass would die. It's just a, it's just a season that it goes through. So that, that's how I would take it to be. It's, it's not giving... You know, there's another verse in the book of Psalms and people will say, well, man... Uh, man is going to live, uh, I've heard it said before, and I've heard this in church, uh, they've said, well, everybody, as long as they don't get a disease or something or do something stupid, they all live at least 70 years uh, and maybe longer. And there's a verse in the Psalms where it says man's days is 70 years and it may be 80, basically. So it says three score and 10 and if it be four or it could be four score. Well, that's not God saying if you don't get a disease or you're guaranteed to live 70 years. It's just this is basically how long people live. 70 is a good, a good average, and then maybe you'll get up to 80 is what it's saying. Uh, so it's not saying that you, all, you will live at least 70 years. So that's how I take this when it says his days are determined. It's not saying you're going to live 70 years, 3 months, and 14 days. It's just okay. you've got a season. And then what you do, you know, as far as that grass, it may last longer or it may live shorter and just like you, you may live longer, you may live less. It's just, uh, but it's a season really. And that's, days are determined, basically that's the season that you'll be on earth as opposed to being in eternity. That, that's how I take Job 14. Okay. And um, one last thought about that question was, um, is it true for us to say that God in his foreknowledge knows when we're going to leave this earth and go be with him? Is yes. that a true statement that he knows when we are going to pass away or are we raptured? Yes. He has that foreknowledge. Okay. All right. Thank you, Eric. Yeah. We appreciate you so much. Can you come back to us at the very end? Well, that's what I was thinking with the very well. Okay. Hey, everybody. What up? Hey, everybody. Put uh, the first weekend in December on your calendar and everybody try to get down here for the conference. Things are. Uh, Things are working out. We're going to put it all together in a couple of weeks, hopefully, and have some details for everybody, hopefully by around October 1st. So thank you, Eric. And you get to meet Eric Newman in person. Whoa. Man, that's exciting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how exciting that is. 
I see him every day in the mirror. I, I'm not too excited about it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, no, we appreciate you, Lenny and Lisa. I know you've done a lot of work to try to get that working for the conference, the Internet there, and going there and talking. And There's a lot of behind-the-scenes preparation for this conference stuff that you don't realize the time it takes unless you actually do it. So yeah. thanks for all the time you've put into it. So it looks like it's going to be at that camp there. And uh, so it's yeah. looking yeah. good. Yeah. And Sam have been helping. And Jerry's been helping. And Tom and Frank. Tom and Frank. Been out. Tony and Sam came out with us. from Hammond. They, they, they watch you on, uh, on tape, delay. They've been a wonderful help. So Kathy and Joe. Yeah, Kathy and Joe Coates have been a huh. lot, lot of legwork for us already. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you, thank you, thank you, everybody. But uh, Eric, come back at the end. I have a prayer request, if you don't mind. Okay. At the very end. Okay. All right. Um, Jason, did you have something? Let me uh, unmute you here. Yes, I... You hear me? You're breaking up a little bit. Yeah, I kind of lost my. Yeah, um, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I lost my. I lost my signal earlier. Um, yeah, I was just to ask it real quick. Um, yeah, it's kind of referring earlier to my question before. Um, so, do you think our our DNA is is the map of of our of our human body and our flesh, or does that include? Do you think our, our, our soul is included in that DNA makeup? I, I don't really know. I mean, I don't know all about the DNA and everything. Um, I know that Philippians 3.21 says God's going to change our vile flesh to make it like His glorified flesh. So, um, you know, if the, D, if the life is in the DNA as far as your soul and your spirit and all that... Um, it will be changed to where now you don't have sin nature and that stuff wired in there and you've got your glorified body and you won't sin and you Christ will live in you perfectly um, so but yeah I don't know all that science stuff but I just know uh, I, I would think it's probably there's life in that and that Jesus would be changing it when he makes change it to our glorified body that would be my thinking on that all right um, James, did you, uh, I, I know you had a couple other things. Did you want to go ahead with yours, your other things? Yes, hello. Um, um, yeah, real quick, uh, on the thing about the, the, you know, the ghost stories and different things like that, um, it reminds me, I, I've read it a number of times, but I, of course, do not remember the verse, but it's one that, it's one of the Apostle Paul warned about the massive wave of deception and so that could be in Christianity that could also be like uh, you know this big woke movement going on um, uh, conservative Republicans uh, any any all of that stuff if we're doing all that apart from God and just you know everything else is sin and unbelief and then you're just but that's the way you're going I mean those things are not going to be our salvation. So this, so the massive wave of deception can be many things uh, all around the world. And things about these ghosts and UFOs and all these different things that constantly go, um, whether you see something or whether you don't, uh, I believe it's definitely part of the massive wave of deception because look at all of the energy that's spent on all of these different stories and, and, and UFOs and all that kind of stuff. It, and especially because, see, the devil's goal is it keeps your eyes off the Lord. It, it, it keeps the world's eyes off God. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. A couple of quick examples. When I was in the Army, I was in Germany for a while. We went to Dachau concentration camp. Uh, when you look back to the Nazi regime, there were a number of them that were highly into the occult. And then, of course, you know, the, what they did at the concentration camps and, uh, to the Jews, to Russian POWs, to, you know, American POWs, Christians, um, you know, gays, all the different things. But primarily it was directed to the Jews. To this, when I was at Dachau concentration camp, this would have been back in the early 90s, the whole time I was there, I felt an extreme evil presence the whole time I was there. 
And so what that reminds me of is, you know, all of the, the Nazi regime being into the occult, it invited more and more satanic presence. And then that doesn't necessarily mean that mean that presence will leave. So I mean, I definitely fell with concentration camps. Another time, years ago, my sister when she lived in Vegas, she was um, she was dating a guy that was uh, he was into body piercings. He I found out, you know, he was he had dabbled into all of these different Eastern religions and and she showed me these different pictures, like of these Indian gods and pagan gods and there was a Japanese Buddhist one. Then, of course, they had a Buddhist statue head, but, but my sister was telling me in this apartment, she's like, she was like, I'm scared at night, I can't sleep, she was like, I'm constantly disturbed. And so I was telling her, and this is even way before I understood right division. Um, it, it's, I went, that was my next thing I want to talk to you about, because I used to go to a church in Texas that was very similar to yours, you know, was laying on the hands of the Spirit, praying in the Spirit until an hour after service, <laughs> being constantly up at the altar, getting the olive oil put on your forehead and all that stuff. Yeah. So this this experience in Vegas, this is probably about 12 years or so ago, I was there visiting my sister and we were hanging out. She was talking about the problems we were having, or that she was having. And so we were, we, we, I'll never forget it, we were sitting, we were laying there watching a movie and all of a sudden, I mean, I, and I've seen, it's, they're, they're, I, we call them shadow people here in California or whatever, but I, I've seen shadow people so many times, you know, running trains all night, you know, from San Luis mm-hmm. to Oakland or San Luis to L.A. or whatever, and you just, you know, you'll see them or driving home or you know, whatever, you'll see these little shadows. And I know what they are, but anyway, we were laying there in this apartment room in Vegas at the time that, that my sister and, you know, living with her boyfriend and all that stuff. And I'm just laying there, and out of the, out of the blue, I, <laughs> there he was, this shadow person. I seen it. I kind of just turned my head because I seen it because they only they're only there for a small glimpse. But right as I did it, my sister asked me, she goes, "Did you see that?" So I knew right away. We both saw it. Yeah. And I'm like, "Yeah, I saw it." And she's like, "Oh my gosh, that's what I'm talking about." So she's so worried. I go, "Crystal, you need to put your trust in the Lord." And so so this is the funny thing about it. I'm like, let me do something. And this is what I remembered about going to this church. I I got the word of God out. And so I went around the apartment. I was, I was sprinkling olive oil and praying over things and and doing stuff. And I'm like, but what I did that night is I left the word of God open. I said, okay, I gotta listen. Let's see if there's a difference. And so after I left and went back home. Lo and behold, she's like, my gosh, she goes, you know what, she goes, I haven't slept better in a long time, and peaceful, she goes, I don't have any more issues, or whatever. I'm like, see, I told you, you need to put your trust in the Lord. So, so now, but all these years later, when I began to learn right the vision, I understand now that even though I went around and threw the olive oil out and all that kind of stuff, none of those little rituals from that denomination is what, what calmed the waters in that apartment, so to speak. It was the fact of placing your faith and trust in the Word of God and, and speaking the Word of God and, and praying over the place and, and, and praying that with with faith and thanksgiving before the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's what made the difference. And I understand that more than ever now, even though I didn't understand right religion then. And then I told her, get rid of that stupid Buddhist head and, and get rid of all those pictures. And then well, they finally later broke up. But that's the whole thing about what, why some of these ghost stories and, and all these things continue years later is because at some point there was someone living there or someone whatever that may have been in the occult or Ouija boards or Satanism or or whatever. And then when they move out, that doesn't mean that the satanic presence will move out. It may stay there. But it's faith in the Word of God that's going to help that stuff go away. Um, so... <clears throat> anyway, I wanted to point out that real quick. But the uh, but I've been in the church, same same as what you were, and um, um, you know, so things like, and then of course I've been to mega churches and all these different things, and so all these experiences, like the wheelchair entertainment. I, I'm like you. I'm, I've been very disappointed and upset that I've been lied to, and I 
over the years, and I but I but I also understand. I've been to churches that that there are pastors that mean well, and right. and even though they're a pastor and they get a salary and all that kind of stuff, that I I've, I've seen a number of pastors. They don't they don't live on a big salary. They they mean well. They're trying to get the word out to people. They're trying to you know preach the gospel. They're trying to, but then they're but then they're under these denominations, so they have to also follow what the denomination dictates. And I, so I've seen it. But but then again, there are those they go into the ministry as a career, and they want to make big money, and they want to you know do this, and and I and I've seen it. So like some of the mega churches, the, the the wheelchair entertainment stuff like that. You know, they, these people have all these wonderful big time emotional experiences. But one thing you won't ever see, they still didn't get out of that wheelchair. And stand up and begin walking. They yeah. weren't healed, and yet they were praying for the healing. And then, but everybody gets so caught up in the entertainment, they don't even pay attention to that. Mm-hmm. They just say, "Oh well, you know, God touched us, and yada yada yada." It's, it's a big entertainment show. Yeah. And but what I wanted to what I wanted to ask about is I got two things. Um, when I was in when I've been in the church in Texas, and then I was in you know, other churches throughout the years, even one here in Paso Robles. Um, a couple of experiences have come to mind. When I was in the denomination where they laid hands on you to receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit, um, and then of course, you babble in tongues or you don't. Um, I babble in tongues, of course, it's 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 called the, the, the language of the claiming symbol is what it is. But, um, but I remember that when I got that, laying on the hands of blessing over me, I literally felt this fountain come all the way up my throat and out my mouth. Hmm. I remember that. Then I remember, um, you know, like say there's an example in a mega church. One time he was doing a prayer over everybody and we're going to come forth and laying hands on prayer and all that. And then he kept telling everybody, oh, the Holy Spirit's all over, as if, as if, as if he's the guy controlling it all. Oh, he's everywhere. He's waiting on you guys to be ready and whatever. And, yeah. You know, it's big. It's entertainment. Mm-hmm. Well, once again, I felt this is another reason I was asking you about the Matthew where the Holy Spirit descended like a dove because this one particular time, I did feel, literally feel, as if being touched by the Holy Spirit as if he was descending on us. That's why I wanted to ask. Mm-hmm. And then another example comes to mind in a, a church here in Paso. Uh, her name is Laura. I know she's a believer. Um, she was laying hands on me one night because my lower back was really bugging me that day. And this, this has been about, say, deal, about 10 years ago. And she, but when she laid hands on me, you know, this wasn't like standard body temperature. I mean, this felt like a heat pad when she laid her hands on me and was praying over my back. And I could feel that heat radiating in my lower back. And so... These are experiences I've had, and I can't deny it, so it's kind of like, you know, so when it comes to these things, my question is, are these things God, are they satanic, or can our deceitful heart really, really create these things? Um, So I've been wondering about stuff like that, because there are things that I have experienced that way, but as far as the shadow people, the ghost stories, the UFOs, and... I mean, yeah, I can, I can, I can pretty much bet that they're all satanic for the most part. So I wanted to touch and ask on that, and then if I have time, I, I needed to ask you a question out of the, the life of Christ notes. Do you want, do you want to touch on the what I just asked first, though? Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, I, I think it's probably two things. I think there is the uh, the power of suggestion, and you know that. Uh, if you you can sort of create things in your mind to make it think so I know for example you'll have you hear these hypnotists and they'll say you know you go to I've seen it where the, the hypnotist is at the I've been to one where they've had I was at like I don't know Disneyland not Disneyland or some, some amusement park like that and they had some hypnotist there and they had this crowd you know you got like 300 people out there and they say they're going to call people up to the stage to and they're going to hypnotize them. Well, they they ask a bunch of questions and they they interact with the audience. I guess to find out because some people 
you, you just can't hypnotize them, and some you can. It's like the power, it's, it's just how the, the person is, I guess. I know I've never been the one that you could do that with. I'm like the skeptical one. I don't, you know, you, you got to show me to believe it. I'm not going to, you know, go along with it. So like the church I grew up in, we had like all those things like you mentioned with the church in Texas. Um, I was in there my whole life. I never felt a presence. I never felt anything when I was there. You look at my grandparents. They were married 52 years. My grandmother spoke in tongues every single night and most every service that we had at church. My grandfather never did that. Uh, he's in the same, he's going to the same church. They're teaching the same thing. He's in the same services. My grandfather just never went for it. Uh, they had certainly laid hands on him and he never felt any presence or anything. Uh, he never felt the fountain coming up like he said. My grandmother, she'd fill it all the time, every day at home. So I, I think part of it is the person. Just like certain people can be hypnotized and others can't, I think certain people would feel those things and others can't. Um, but the other part, I think, is it is, uh, it is satanic because God isn't doing those things today. God's doing it through His Word. But there is a legitimate satanic power through those things. Uh, the book I wrote, um, I think it's called Tongues Rightly Divided. It's a small book I did. I had a conference on that uh, two years ago. And... Basically, I went through there. Um, there is a there's a section on there I call it, it's a Kundalini Yoga, which is a segment of Hinduism, and that has that the idea of those chakras that I mentioned to Paula when we we're talking about the AMA. Uh, there is some legitimate energy or power that could come through that. Kundalini Yoga is part of the Hindu religion. You can find videos uh, on YouTube of Kundalini Yoga and look at what's going on, and it's very similar to what I saw in my church, the Holy Ghost moving and things. And so it's, uh, and there are legitimate healings and things that are done in Kundalini Yoga. So it is, there is a satanic power that comes through that. And so I think that's what, um, it is, it's Hinduism, which is largely associated with India. I don't think it's any coincidence that Benny Hinn was from uh, that origin, Indian origin, and, uh, and has that, you know, he would throw his coat or, or move his hand and the whole people would be knocked down. I think, so I think there are, I think it's, uh, I think Kundalini Yoga has satanic power and that would be part of it. I know in that book, Tongues Rightly Divided, I mentioned in there and um, the details with the Azusa Street Revival that happened and that's where really it's the Pentecostal, the tongue talking started supposedly. Uh, if you look through the history, tongue talking really started with the Mormons. They were heavily into it. Uh, being Mormon, you, you may know that, until around 1910 or so, I think it was, when the president of the Mormons at that time told people not to do it anymore. And then they stopped doing it. But before then, before 1910, especially in the late 1800s, it was very common that a Mormon, a good Mormon, would speak in tongues, or at least knew another Mormon who spoke in tongues. Very common among the Mormons. It's, I don't think it's any coincidence that the Azusa Street Revival started about the same time as the Mormons declared that to not be something they should be doing anymore. And I think it was a Kundalini Yoga thing and that uh, it seemed like the Azusa Street Revival, they didn't start speaking in tongues until they had somebody who already spoke in tongues lay hands on them. So that was somebody, like you mentioned with the house, there's this satanic presence or power in the house. Well, it seems like that person already had that tongue talking in them and they had to lay hands on this other person. They had to come to California to the Azusa Street and lay hands on them before they started speaking in tongues. They were seeking it before and they never got it until that person lay hands on them. So when you talk about people laying hands and there's like this fountain that opens up or you feel this presence or the power, I think there could be something real to that, that it could be uh, the Kundalini Yoga spirit, which would be satanic. And... Uh, um, associated with that so that's um, that would be my comments and I think it's I think it's two things it's the it's, it's basically you have to have the mindset and the willingness to go along with it and then you also have to have the actual satanic power too I think is what it is yeah that's cool um, yeah speaking of that Azusa Street I you know I think when I was in the military I was visiting my mom 
I think I went to that Azusa Street Revival. My my sister actually, the same one in Vegas, her and her friend went and I went with them because my mom used to live in like Glendora and Azusa years ago and I, I think we went to that back in the 80s. I just can't remember the name of what it was, the church or whatever, but real big, big crowd and I, I think we... I think we went to that. And the church isn't there anymore. I went about 10 years ago, and it wasn't there yeah. anymore. But uh, but yeah, yeah back in the 80s, late, it probably was. Yeah, Yeah, this would have been the late 80s. Yeah. They had like bikers, you know, escort me in and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. There was all kinds of, you know, sage people there, you know. Um, uh, do I have time on the notes thing? If I make it fast? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, this, I, Kenny, Kenny gave me this copy of the Life in Christ notes, and I, and I, I basically, I've read through page 30 so far. Um, the real quick thing I had was on this page 29, easy believism. I'll, let me just read down to the Corinthians so I can show you what I need. Uh, it says, words cannot even begin to explain what a relief it was that I no longer had to worry about what I did in order to maintain my salvation, although it took some time to get out of the mindset of saying, Lord, please forgive me for that thought I had. I just had and saved me again, over and over. I've done the same thing. I have stopped getting sick and can now sleep through the night. As far as Christianity is concerned, I had gone from one extreme to the other. I soon found out that the belief of eternal security is seen by most church denominations as being easy believism. In other words, they see it as an excuse to sin rather than as being the truth of God's word for today. It turns out that no Christian church denomination believes in eternal security. Granted, the Baptists say that they believe in eternal security, but they really do not believe it. For example, if I became a member of their church, was there every Sunday had a godly lifestyle, and then murdered someone, they would say that I was never saved in the first place, because I never had saving faith or true faith. Therefore, and more, I've heard that too, same thing, the baby story. <laughs> Therefore, although Baptists claim to believe in eternal security, they really do not because they would condemn to hell anyone who does not meet their standard of living. However, eternal security means that there is nothing I can do to lose my salvation. Therefore, even a mass murderer and child molester, if he has trusted in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sin, has the gift of eternal life, even if he continues to live as he did before he believed. That is why Paul told the Corinthians four times in the same letter that all things were lawful for him to do, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and 10, 23. The objection is, but God did not save him to continue in sin. Yes, that is correct, but it still does not mean that he loses his salvation if he sins. Okay, my question is, uh, 6, 12, 1 Corinthians 6.12, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Mm -hmm. And then 10.23, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Okay, my question is very simple. I can't understand what he's saying in these verses, and I think it mainly is because of, you know, old proper English, and then we often don't use it today. Can you explain to me how I can understand this in today's slang English? Because I'm not getting what he's saying in these verses. <clears throat> he's saying um, that I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. So God is not going to judge me based upon my performance. That's what all things are lawful unto me means. When he says all things are not expedient, that means that uh, all things are not the best thing to do. So, you know, uh, me, um, let's say, uh, let's say watching an R-rated movie, let's say. Um, it, I, God is not going to count it against me for watching an R-rated movie. So it's, it's lawful unto me. I can do it. I can watch an R-rated movie. But is that the best thing for me to do? Probably not. It's better if I watch a, if I wanted entertainment, watch something that didn't have the curse words or the violence or the nudity in it, let's say. Um, so that would be, that's what all things are not expedient means. That's that part of it. So all things are lawful, meaning um, 
I can't lose my salvation. No sin is going to be counted against me. I can do whatever I want, but I shouldn't do whatever I want because I should do the things that are expedient or that's profitable. So all things are not expedient. And then the last part of the verse there, verse 12, when he says, I will not be brought under the power of any means, well, I will not let sin control me. Since I have the opportunity to let Christ live in me, I'm not going to live in sin. And then the one in 10, uh, 23, when he says, all things edify not, then he's basically saying, well, then I want to do things that are according to sound doctrine. So the six, the six twelve is, I'm not going to be brought under the power of sin. And the 10, 23 is, I'm going to do things that, uh, that edify. I'm going to get in sound doctrine. Okay, so basically all things edify not, therefore I'll focus on the things that do edify. Is that a better way? That's, that 10, that? that's 1023. Yes. Yeah. And 612 is, um, there's a lot of sinful things out there and I will not let them control me. Okay. Is, that would be 612. So 612 is more focused on the not sinning part, and the 1023 is more focused on uh, operating in the sound doctrine. Okay. All right, yeah, that helps. It's, uh, yeah, that's part of gradually getting understanding is, we, you know, in the King James, you, you deal with a lot of proper English, and we're just not used to always speaking that in this day and age, but it's, yeah. it's correct English, you know, that we're used to slang all the time. Yeah. Cool. All right, thanks. Thanks, James. Thanks for sharing. All right. All right, uh, Jerry, uh, you want to go ahead? Yes. Uh, first thing, when, you, when we all say goodbye, I, I need you to do is go make you a high-protein drink and take the rest of the day off. That was that was a marathon, Aaron. Yeah. Um, good thing you've been working out for the last several months. You needed you need that. <coughs> your your endurance is needed. That's it's, right. <laughs> it is physically exhausting to do what you do. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, I get I get physically exhausted a lot just studying God's word. And you think, yeah, how is that? I'm not uh, I'm not running. I'm not lifting anything. You know. But but that's true. It it can be physically yeah, it's exhausting. Weariness to the flesh. You know, yeah. The flesh just oh, yeah. But you, uh, your spiritual anyway. Get that protein drink in your face and take the rest of the day off. Uh, a lot a lot of different topics. Tremendous. Um, a lady asked me uh, a little over a year ago. Is God healing today? And I said I'm gonna say something to you. That's my thoughts. But, and I don't say this to very many people. You may be the first. It's not, is God healing today? He cannot heal today. Hmm. And I said, do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know, like, while we were having this study, how many people were praying over dying loved ones? And how throughout the, just the United States, and just the week, how many people are in the emergency room from accidents near death right now, and, and the families are praying over them, and so it's both all the things that we very familiar with and, and pray for people who were who've done that over and over here today. Is it the fact that God's healing some and not healing some, and all the different things that come up? Think about it, and because but. With all the questions of the ghosts, the aliens, uh, not all Israel, Israel, like Frank talked about, always go back and consider the source of the information you do have that may back up some of that stuff and make it real. <laughs> and uh, just consider the source where all that comes from against the Word of God right in the body. And it will help a lot, so... But uh, tremendous uh, afternoon. We thank you, Eric. Yeah, th thank you, Jerry. Yeah, one of the things you said, that was one of the things um, 
that I noticed before. I learned right division, but I hadn't learned the physical healing part. That The church I was going to didn't teach about that. They were still praying for physical healings and those things. And I read um, Philip Yancey, a popular Christian author, mainstream Christian author, wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace? And I read that, and he brought out that point you just made, is that if God is physically healing today, and people say, well, you know, God did this miracle or did that, um, what do I do with the people that I know who have just as much faith, if not more, than those people who were healed, and they prayed, and they did not get healed? So why is it? I mean, you say you had the faith of the grain of the mustard seed, you're going to get healed, and yet these people who had more faith than the people who got healed, and they didn't get healed. And so that, that right there, to me, that's what got me started to thinking and saying, well, you know, that, that's, maybe there's something to that. You know? And that was before I ever heard Richard Jordan or anybody saying God is not physically healing today. But, and so I, I think that's good that you brought that up. You know, why? Yeah, people go say, go ahead, Jerry. No, go ahead, finish up. I was going to say, people say that, oh, so-and-so got healed of cancer, so-and-so, or I got healed of this back problem, or this happened, but yet, what about all the other people who read the Bible more than you do, who pray more than you do, who have more faith than you, and they didn't get healed? So why did you get healed and not that other person? So that, I think that's a good line of thinking there to show God's not physically healing today. Yes, and I put that, I use that word, cannot. I wanted to yeah. see the, I wanted to see the, and hear the, reply back from the lady who's coming out of the healing uh, industry and uh, and to see how she responded and uh, do you know what I'm talking about do you know what I'm saying and I explained let's take a ride over to the children's hospital mm -hmm. and walk through there and see what's going on watch the parents in there that's on their knees praying to God for that 2 year old 15 year old not to be killed by cancer God, and I use that word cannot on purpose, he cannot heal today. And I'm going to leave it go at that, think about it, because we know he can, I just said he cannot heal today. When we leave, right after we leave, he begins to do that again. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Satan says, you, you, you take and stop this healing, I'll pick it up. I'll, yeah. take, I'll take that. Yeah. So, think about it in that. Uh, well, thank you, Eric, for the uh, marathon. Appreciate it. <laughs> thank a lot you, Jerry. Of, a lot of um, great time, a lot of good questions. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I enjoyed the, all the questions. Iron sharpeneth iron. So thank you, everybody, for that. Before I go to Lisa, did you have something, Connie? Oh, okay. Uh, before I go to Lisa, did anybody else have anything? Okay, Lisa. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. Um, I might be a little emotional. My sister Helen is very sick, and um, her body is not processing food. She is um, it's been I think two weeks now. It's not her gallbladder. She's very nauseated, and she's um. Not to be graphic, but when she does throw up, the food's not processed. And I've never known anybody that's gone through that. So, of course, I'm thinking the big C. It's the first thing that's going through all of our minds. And my sister Helen is so precious. And now she's, she's 75, I think. Just a gentle, gentle spirit, gentle soul. And she does profess faith in God. So, um, they're trying to get her in some tests, and that one test is to see how her stomach does process food. It's called an emptying of the, of the stomach test, and that's a month from now is when they can schedule it. And they, the, end of, the endoscope is a week from now, a week from Wednesday. So, I'm, I'm praying, I mean, they may just need to hospitalize her and put her in the hospital and just run the test, you know, but... And I'm thinking, well, maybe it can be autoimmune disease, you know, because autoimmune diseases do crazy things to our body. But the fact that she might, and I know I'm, I can't even say it, but I just want to pray for my sister. 
and her name is Helen, and um, you know, life throws us these curveballs, and um, I'm so grateful for the body of Christ, I'm so grateful for God's word, I'm so grateful for your lesson today, Eric, it's amazing, so, anyways, I just want everybody to know, my dear sister Helen, you know, she has this curveball thrown at her, and She's suffering. Right now she's suffering. She's nauseated. She's taking Zofran and it's not helping. When she eats, you know, it's not processing. So she's really suffering. We don't think about, you know, we eat. And it reminds me of Sandy. You know, Sandy who had, who had stomach cancer. And now she is thankful where she started to eat again. But, um, I mean, I love to eat. and you know, The things we take for granted. But anyways, eternal life is what's most important. Where my sister's headed, whenever she head is there, is most important. The peace she can have now, until that time. And I don't mean to be speculating. I'm just very emotional about it. I found out more details this morning about everything. So, anyways, it's just because I love her, you know. I think of the scripture that says, um, Rejoice with those who rejoice. And weep with those who weep, and we are here for one another. So I just wanted to share my heart, my heart's burden today for my sister. And yeah. um, could I go ahead and pray for her? Would that be okay? That would be, thank you, Eric. Dear Lord, we thank you for Lisa's sister Helen that she has trusted in your death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for her sin. We thank you then. Whenever she goes, that she will be going to heaven. She is seated together with Christ in heavenly places. She's forgiven all her sins. That she's got the Holy Ghost within her. She's got the mind of Christ. I pray that you will help her utilize these things right now, especially during this trying time, as uh, all of us during that time would be focused on the physical. I know when I was going through COVID and Lana was, uh, that's what I was thinking of. And so... Obviously, if she's throwing up and having all these issues and not processing her food, I mean, all kinds of doubts and things must be going through her mind of what could it be and how serious it is and is there a cure and all those things. I pray that you that the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard her hearts and minds. That you will help her focus on the things that are of you, that are true, that are lovely, that are honest, that are just, that are of good report that she would have the mind of Christ throughout all these things. Whether she's a simple solution is found and she's better quickly, or if there is no solution found, or that it's a difficult solution, whatever the result is, help, us, Lord, help her, Lord, to live by the faith of the Son of God, to have that mind of Christ, and to rejoice in who she is in Christ, who you've made her to be, that Christ is living in her, and that through that, the others who see her would see the spiritual focus in the midst of a heavy, difficult, physical trial. And that she would, re and it would cause those other people that see that to see Christ in her, the love of Christ coming through her, so that they may be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth as well. I pray for our dear sister Lisa, who is obviously burdened with this, as any sister would. I pray that you will give her the peace of knowing that her sister is going to heaven and who she is in Christ. And obviously being concerned with her physically, I pray that you will um, help her come up with a solution and be able to uh, you know, be that minister for Christ for a lot longer on this earth and also be that support for Lisa and others that love her dearly. And so uh, just just be with, be with Helen and be with the family and her friends and everybody in this. Help them to focus on the spiritual, who they are in Christ, and I pray that Christ will triumph through her and uh, that you will be glorified in whatever happens. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Eric, Thank so you, much. Eric. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. So uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good day, everybody. All right, Eric. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye.